Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Penguin Y no platform YA book club. I know the name of our own book club. I'm a professional. I've not like I've been doing this for eight different book clubs already. Um, so yes, welcome again to everyone who is rejoining us, and hello to new people. Um, I think I've already put into the chat, but like. I've realized that we've never asked where you guys are watching from. And I'm absolutely intrigued to see how many people are from the UK and how many people are from elsewhere. I kind of want to figure out who the furthest away person is who's watching these book clubs. So let us know in the chat, pretty please. Um, so for those of you who are watching this going, a book club, I didn't know there was a book club. I I'm so confused. Um, well, let me tell you about it. Um, essentially, we read a different YA book every single month. And then on the last Tuesday, normally of the month, uh, we have a little Q&A, live Q&A with the author, um, which is really exciting because you can read the book and immediately if there's anything that you're confused about or desperately need to know, you just ask the author, the best person to ask. Um, you can use the hashtag, hashtag platform YA book club on social media to share your thoughts as you're reading or ask questions to the author. We will collect all of those from social to ask tonight. Um, and also to meet fellow readers. Uh, we also have a discord, which is linked in the description, which is a really fun book community. We now have a recipes and food channel where we're talking all about uh, like recipes from books and, and making lots of stuff from uh, our favorite books, which is very fun. Uh, and finally, if you are a bookish creator, if you have a book TikTok or YouTube channel or Instagram or anything like that, and you um, talk about any of the books we're doing for the book club, please, please, please like tag us, let us know, because we really want to look at and share and promote your stuff as well. Um, so today I am here with the wonderful Manjeet Man, who is going to be uh, talking to me about her book, Run Rebel, which I have here, but as you can probably tell by the front cover, it's different to the one that you probably have at home because you probably have this extremely beautiful front cover that I'm very jealous of. Um, hello, Manji, welcome to the book club. Hi, Hi Anna, um, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Um, so uh, I am going to get up my questions, but if you in the audience would like to ask Manji any questions, please, please put them in the live chat. We have Simon standing by as ever to um, deliver them over to me so that I can ask them. Um, let's have a quick look at our questions to begin. Are we gonna begin with one of mine or one of the readers? One of mine, we always start with the readers and it's my turn now. Um, so <laughs> let's uh, talk about the fact this is a novel in verse. And that's quite, I feel like they're becoming more common but it's still quite unusual to see. So from your point of view, like why did you decide to write a novel in verse rather than a straight novel? And like, what can it bring? Like what can poetry bring to a novel that normal prose can't? Yeah, um, I feel like uh, I didn't really decide, which I know sounds like a little bit of a wanky answer, but it did just sort of come to me in verse and maybe um, a couple of reasons. I think at the time I was reading a lot of novels in verse. I am a real fan of verse novels, um, but also I feel like um, just coming from an acting background, it was something that was that came quite naturally because I was imagining it being performed. And I think that's what sort of spoken word and verse novels kind of kind of bring really. So I think um, I was kind of sort of staying in a bit of a comfort zone and writing, writing what I know and how I know, which is for performance. And I think that's why it sort of came to me a little bit sort of naturally really, the whole verse element. Can you talk a bit about the structure of the book? Because it's in these six parts. It kind of, because you've got these individual poems and you've got mainly it's Amber and then you've got these two sections that we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but you have these six different sections. Was that something that was always in the book? It was always kind of based on this idea of rebellion and revolution or was it something that came later to kind of give some structure to the story? Do you know what? It came later and it came quite late. Um, I think maybe the penultimate draft um, before that, the, the novel was in four sections, but it was just like part one, part two, part three, part four. Um, and I think it was some of the parts are what are parts of the revolution as well. So I, I just remember from memory, part one was bound and it was that that poem that comes after part one. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that came in quite late funnily enough. Um, but the revolution was always in there. So those history lessons were always in there. That story was always in there. But um, I think on the penultimate draft, I thought, oh, hey, I can like, I can draw this out 
a bit better actually um because I think myself and my editor we, there was just something missing and we couldn't quite put our finger on it um and then when I started to put it against the actual stages of, of, of a revolution it kind of all sort of came together quite magically so it was a nice uh, happy accident to fall into it's an interesting experience for a reader because you obviously you, there's a feeling of anticipation in any story when you're waiting to see what happens next but when you're being told oh this is just the honeymoon period like literally on the page you're being told like don't get used to this like, <laughs> and like when I'm reading a book I know it's not all going to be happy we've still got 150 pages left but like let me just live man you please like but it was so fun to like read a book that had but like equally you knew that if it followed those paths to revolution there was going to be a there's potentially dramatic change at the end. Um, yeah. Speaking of the end, just to let everyone know, as we always do, um, we are gonna be keeping any spoilerific questions until the end, um, just so you can hop up if you haven't quite finished the book and you won't get spoiled, you can still kind of watch along now. So I will let you know when those super spoilery questions come. For now, we're just kind of talking general and we'll, we'll dig in a bit later. Um, so you said that this was the the kind of uh, six part came quite late. How much changed from that first draft? Was it super different from when you first kind of started writing or is it pretty much the same? Um, it was kind of, no, I think I, it didn't change really. I think my first draft was just really short. It was half the size of what the book is. Wow. Um, I think it's because I'd read a lot of verse novels, like American verse novels, and they're really short. Like mm -hmm. they're half the word count of like British verse novels is what I'm kind of seeing. Um, and so I was like, brilliant, bish, bash, bosh, get it out, here we go. And my editor was like, we need more. Um, so the actual, so that first draft was really like the bare bones of the story really, which is still there, it's still there. And then I just basically built on it and built on it as I, as I redrafted, um, yeah, putting more meat on its bones. So it didn't really change, it just grew. <laughs> Um, we're going to actually go with a question from Pippin, who is in fact in, I have seen, is in the uh, live stream at the moment, um, coming from the UK. Um, this was the question that I mentioned to you before the call where it was, um, they asked the question and then immediately were like, oh, okay, got to section six, now I get maybe what the answer is going to be. But I thought I'd ask it anyway in case you had any insights into this kind of topic of the title and how you come up with the title and all that kind of things. They ask, how did you come up with the title? Was the dual meaning of the word rebel and rebel and that noun and verb kind of intentional? Oh, I wish I could take credit. <laughs> I wish I could take credit for the title and I can't. It is all and the, um, and, and the Penguin team, I think. Yeah, the first, um, the title that um, I was, it was always a working title. I was never really married to it. It was flying solo. So it was all about this, this young girl who's like flying into a future and the whole sort of idea of like running was like on her own and yeah she's flying solo uh, anyway and as it was sort of like coming to the end they were like we really need to change the title We're not working and I was like don't worry um <laughs> I wasn't married to it um yeah and it kind of went through a few iterations actually it was like the revolution of Amber Rye for a little while um the, at the end they thought that was a bit too long um, and then yeah my editor Carmen the wonderful wonderful Carmen came up with Run Rebel um, I wish she was here um, but yeah what a marvellous title what a brilliant title um, mm -hmm. I just wish I could take credit for it. <laughs> thing. As I said so uh, Old Pippin is in from the UK we also had someone else from NY I'm assuming that's New York which is so far away amazing hello American I imagine that if it's in New York, it's probably more afternoon your time rather than evening. We are, yeah. We're still in the 7 p.m. UK slot, which is the, we finish just before Bake Off starts so that everyone can sort of have a very cozy night of author into Bake Off, which I... <laughs> nice. Um, so how much, so in terms of, I know we have a lot of people who watch this stream who are quite into writing themselves and are kind of interested. And I think with a normal novel that isn't, that's just a prose novel, there is this idea of like the three act structure and you can always plan what you're gonna have in each chapter and it maybe has that flow to it. And we've had some authors on before who have some plan from the very beginning, everything in detail, some just have a vague idea. How does it work with a novel in verse? Like, do you have ideas initially for different poems you want to do within it? Do you know the story, but not how you're going to put it into to verse? Um, yeah, so for me, I still have that three act structure in my head. 
I still have that like story arc, which is very much because I write plays as well. So it's very much kind of like a theatrical device. So I still I still have that. Um, and I have a loose plan. So, um, yeah, I, I always know how it's going to end. I always know how it's going to end. I don't quite know how it's going to start. I kind of know how it's going to start. I always know what the middle is. Um, so I kind of know I have a loose structure and then I just basically go for it. And I start to write and I free write and I do not stop until I get to the end. And it's something that I call my vomit draft. Nobody will ever read that draft. Um, and then from that vomit draft, and it might be like 20,000 words, it might be like just 10,000 words. But from that, that's when I can start really planning and start drawing out and seeing exactly what works. Um, so I definitely have that plan. But it is a loose plan because I think for me anyway, I just I need to give myself space to like start writing and oh, things can change and that's OK. In terms of the verse, um, it just I just allow myself to free write. So it's not like I'm kind of going, oh, this is how it's going to be. And yeah, the verse changes a lot through my editing. Um, but I just again, each verse, it's almost like it's it gets its own rough plan. Each one gets its own like kind of like rough free write. Uh, but it's saying what I want it to say and it's getting me to the next point. So it's kind of half planning and half just going for it and just getting to the end because I, I need that. I need to just get it all out. Otherwise I get two in my head. And then if I get two in my head, I scare myself. And then I tell myself that I can't do it. That's fair. What do, I mean, how, how do you get out of that then if you're in that, in a, in a place where you feel like writer's block or like, oh, I don't know if I can do this if I'm the right person to be doing this. How do you get out of that? Is it other people? Is it just like, fortifying yourself, just writing, how do you do it? Oh God, how do I do it? I think I just fight through it. I'll have a break. I think when you start, when you start to feel like that, walk away. It might be walk away for an hour, it might be walk away for, it might be walk away for a week. Um, I cry a lot, I cry a lot when I write. <laughs> I, I, cry. I literally have, I'm really annoyed because I wrote it down on a piece of paper and then I lost the paper somewhere in my room. I wrote down all the times I cried during this book and I was like, this one, this, I know what, which ones was it? It was, um, I will say in the least spoilery way possible, the university essay, the, like, it's like all of like, blah, 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 the bit where um, her best friend gives her a crystal and she accepts it. The, it's like, this will mean nothing for people who haven't finished the book, but all, every single one of them, I was like, no, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, I think my crying comes from not necessarily any kind of like sentimental things that I might write, but just like, I can't do it. I'm rubbish. Why did I even think that I could do this? So I cry a lot when I get writer's block, but in the end, I just, I have a very good partner and he just sort of like gets me through it. Cause he's a writer as well. So he just sort of, you know, just tells me that I can and just, put it away for a week or so and then come back to it. And I think um, as I, have now that I'm working on novel number two, I'm a lot better. My, like my mental health is a little bit better with this one than it was for the first one. I think it's just because I don't know, I've grown a bit of a thicker skin. Uh, I've done it once, you know, maybe I don't need to worry so much this time. I will get to the end, I will do it. So yeah, it's just a learning curve, I think. Um, I'm going to just remind everyone who is watching, if you want to ask any uh, questions to Manjeet, then put them, please, please put them in the live chat. We'd love to be able to ask her some of your questions. Um, I uh, normally ask this one first, but I feel like the, the kind of intrigue of the novel inverse thing had me going on that, that route first. But what was the inspiration specifically behind the novel? Because there's kind of, I guess there's potentially different places that the inspiration came from, because you've got her family stuff, her school and her friendships, her... Um, uh, running and her athleticism as well like where did those all come from are those things within your life and your interests or uh just your imagination um a bit of both um it's very much a personal novel it's it's not 100 percent autobiographical but i'm definitely writing um what i know and things that i've been through um so there's so there's that part of it um yeah and the running thing as well that's that's quite a personal thing for me and how I found running um and then yeah and there's just bits of imagination you have to I think unless I was going to write a memoir um step away from myself and 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 put other things in there in the story like yeah uh, one thing my in the very first sort of like um first and second drafts maybe were were quite dark I didn't see them as quite dark mm -hmm. Um, I was just like, no, this is real life and I want it to be real and I want it to be truthful. And she just kept saying, <clears throat> this is a YA novel, Manji. Um, some, some happy moments, please. 
<laughs> and she's done that with the second one as well. We really need some lighter moments, Maggie. And I realised, oh my gosh, I must be quite, I think I'm just quite dark. And it's only recently I went back to a first draft and I was like, oh my God, it really was. Um, so yeah, I think the, my own imagination bits are probably those lighter bits actually that I had to kind of find in my deepest, darkest soul um, just, to, just to give that light relief to the novel. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit me and, you know, obviously a bit not me either as well. Um, did you, have you, um, thinking about like it being experiences that you've been through and things like that, were you writing a lot when you were a teenager? Was that something that you had the impetus to do when you were, experiencing like life as a teenager or is it something that you've come to when you're a bit older kind of looking back older coming back yeah I didn't really write I didn't really read that much as a kid actually we didn't have books in the house we weren't a house of of books um we used to go to um my local library quite a lot so um yeah I mean I, I, like, like I did read but I wasn't like one of these I'm always sort of jealous of authors when they kind of go, oh, I read loads and I used to write loads and I think, oh God, um, I don't deserve to be here. Um, but yeah, but the the writing really has only come in the last sort of like five years, actually. Um, I think my outlet as a kid was acting um, and that was where I was. I was just tunnel vision. I'm going to be an actor and that's what I'm going to do. And so at school, um, I was involved in all the plays and, and, and that was my outlet. And then as an adult, again, still an actor. And then when I started to get fed up with the parts that I was getting, I was like, mm, maybe I'll write my own. And so I started writing plays and I started writing little bits of telly. Um, yeah, and then the, the whole book thing is just completely took me by surprise. And it's because of the whole Right Now initiative that I was part of. So that really brought out the whole sort of novel thing. It was never anything that I ever saw in my future, really. I thought special people do that. I'm not clever enough. I'm not good enough for that, but yeah. Can you talk a bit about right now? How is your experience? Because I imagine some people um, who are watching might know what it is and some people might might not. Can you kind of explain a bit about it? Yeah, so I was on the inaugural right now year. So that was 2017 cohort. Um, and it was an initiative um, from Penguin to bring uh, marginalised voices um, to the forefront. So... Um, yeah sort of like working class and BAME and LGBTQ and um, anybody who's really felt like their voice hasn't been heard um, so it's an amazing initiative is it in its fourth year now I think um, mm. and so I mean I think thousand I think we had like almost 3,000 people that applied in my year and like 10 of us got chosen and I think each year there's been about 10 or 12 people that have been chosen. And then you work with an editor one-on-one -on -one and um, hopefully get your novel out and through acquisitions and out in the world. Um, so yeah, so it was, it, I mean, I was really lucky. I think everybody was, um, but my editor's just amazing and the whole team is brilliant. And she really helped kind of mentor me and just and get me through to that very last draft. And yeah, couldn't be more thankful really. I just sort of think if it wasn't for that, I don't know. I don't, I think it just would have remained an idea in my head and not really gone any further. I'm very glad that they go better because I really love it. Um, if you, so you've obviously like talked about the idea of it being in terms of the experiences that there's some things that you've gone through but I think there's often this question when you have YA or teen writing how you as an adult author kind of keep in touch with that kind of teen voice or teen experience um how how have you done that is it a case of hanging around TikTok and seeing what the teens up to or is it more of a kind of universal voice that's that you kind of remember from being a teenager yeah, I think so. I think it's more of a universal voice. Um, it just, it, again, a bit like the verse, I didn't choose to write. I just thought I have to write YA. I feel like my teenage self didn't get to speak much and she's got a lot to say. <laughs> so <laughs> she's going to have a lot to say. There's a lot of books. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's just that, that, that teenager in me. I think I say it in the Q and A at the end of the book. Um, yeah, it's this, this book and, and the other ones that are, to, that, are, that are to follow. It's for that teenager in me that didn't have a voice at the time. And now, now she's got stuff to say. I mean, amazing segue into Pippin's next question, which is about the audiobook, because I listened to the audiobook of it. Um, once I know, as an author, what was it like narrating your own audiobook? Ah, dream come true. Um, I remember when, when, when it was published, I was sort of thinking, oh, I really hope they want to do an audiobook. 
and they better ask me. <laughs> they better not ask another actor. <laughs> so, I mean, it was just when I got that email, I was like, ah. Oh, because I've done a lot of audiobooks, but I've recorded other people's audiobooks. So it was just a very magical experience to suddenly be doing my own. Yeah. Did you record it in the um, Penguin offices? I did. Yeah. It took about it took about three days. I think it was. Yeah. Did you do it with Roy. I did. He's so oh. great. You've got none of you guys will have met Roy, but I was re I'm really sad because I really wanted to do a platform video with him because he's honestly the nicest man who's ever existed. And he's so but like I've been in there when he's been um, with people recording audiobooks. I've taken some like we had some um, young people who came in just to see what the offices were about. And we I kind of went in thinking that Roy would just be like, oh, hello, everyone. This I'm Roy. This is, you know, the studio. Goodbye. But he was like, let's go on a tour. Let's you can read your favorite book. Let's try you in the booth. And he's a delight. So I'm really every time anyone talks about recording audio for Penguin, I'm like, I think I know who you might have been experiencing. Um, yeah. Amazing. I mean, do, were you when you were writing it, were you sort of reading it aloud? And because you kind of talked a bit about that spoken word aspect and like being a performer. And was it that you were like reading it and then reading it out for that rhythm and that kind of uh, experience as well as like the sort of silent reading kind of book experience? Yeah, definitely. I always read it out loud. Um, yeah, and I'd probably do that even if it wasn't in verse. I think you just, just, just to get rhythm of prose as well, you know, and just if there's dialogue, you just need to sort of hear how it sounds off the page. Um, so yeah, I'm always reading out loud. Um, I want to talk a little bit about inspiration in various different ways. Um, so I guess, first of all, I know that you talk about uh, at the end of the book in the Q&A, I'd really love to hear you talk about kind of either other authors that have inspired you or that you think kind of run alongside this novel, which, uh, yeah, either inspired the writing or have a, have a similar style. If someone's kind of read this book and is like, oh, wow, like I really want to try more novels in verse or more novels about protest or, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> Yeah, so, well, f starting off with first novels, of Sarah Crossan, the queen of them. She's amazing, um, but I really love me. My favourite first novels have probably been Jason Reynolds or Kwame Alexander, all of their novels. Um, oh, gosh, and now, see, now my mind goes blank. Um, uh, Joseph Quelo, uh, he's amazing, and... Um, Oh, oh gosh, there's just so many. There's loads. Oh, Louisa Reed is a, is somebody that I've just sort of like found out about recently. She's she's written two, Gloves Off and Wrecked, and they're both absolutely brilliant. Um, so those are off the top of my head. Um, and then, you know, I really love like Angie Thomas. Like she's amazing. Again, I just really love like, I love a good underdog story. You know, I love a story where somebody needs to rise up so Angie's great at that isn't she Angie Thomas and also Mohammed Khan as well I think I mentioned him at the back of the book um yeah so those are the ones that are probably at the top of my head yeah um anyone in the in them um, the live chat by the way uh I know obviously we're asking for questions but if other people do have book recommendations they want to share with each other please do because we love to hear a good a good book recommendation other than the 12 that we will be reading next year for the book club because uh, I'm sure that we may it's all it's often a common theme with these book club books that people on the discord are like oh I'm starting now I really hope I can finish like halfway through the month and like 24 hours later they're like okay I've finished the book already um so I think that the more book recommendations we can get the better um did you uh read any other um novels in verse while you were working on the book are you the kind of writer who likes to be inspired by like other people's poetry and art at the same time or were you like I need to put them away and work out what I am saying in this book yeah the latter I can't read anything if I'm yeah I mean especially verse novels um I think I started reading like memoirs you know sort of like we you know sort of adult kind of books and memoirs as, as, as I was writing but I wasn't actually reading very much I found it quite difficult definitely wouldn't even touch a verse novel so I haven't sort of um yeah read I, I read a couple of verse novels in between this one finishing and starting the next one but now I'm off them again because now I'm <laughs> now I'm writing I'm like no nope, can't read any same when I'm writing when I'm writing plays I can't I find it really difficult to go to the theatre um so yeah I just need to kind of like shut off from everything otherwise I'm just the queen of self-sabotage I'll just say oh they've done it they've done it better can't do it that's a reason not to carry on so I just have to 
sort of just shut myself off from the world a little bit um just so I can finish <laughs> Um, I'm going to grab for this section another um, question from a reader it's from 20 something who asks um, who inspires you they've they've put as a writer or a person I feel like we've kind of gone through a few writery uh, inspirations do you have people who inspire you outside of writing whether it is within theatre or just in life in general theatre or in life in general um, for me life in general I guess um, I feel like because I've come to like, like novels and being an author is something quite, quite new for me for a long time. And I still do anybody out there who's an actor who started to write and produce and direct their own stuff. I'm just like, who are they? What have they done? And I read and like watch everything that they've done and like box sets and box sets of all the sort of like telly stuff that they've written. Um, so anybody who um, perhaps, you know, their career wasn't going the way they wanted it to go. So they, so they took a step back and started doing things for themselves. Mm -hmm. they, those are the people that really, really inspire me. So, I mean, they're, they're big now, but people like Ricky Gervais and like James Corden, like I know that he's a big talk show host now, but like he wrote Fat Friends and he wrote Gavin Estate because he wasn't getting the acting work that he wanted. And the same with Ricky Gervais and stuff. And yeah, and uh, there's women like your Greta Gerwigs and your Brit Marlings and people like that. It's like, you know, uh, a major inspiration for me. Um, in the book, we see Amber learning about protests in school. Was that a kind of a big, like real life events and protests and stuff? Was that a big inspiration for you when you were writing? Um, there wasn't anything that I could draw that I could draw upon on that whilst I was writing the book, but it was just um, no, it was just the idea of 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 rebelling, and I guess that's com that's coming a little bit from me. So it wasn't like this big rebellion. Um, it's it's a personal rebellion, and I think personally for me, I feel like I'm all against my family, um, and so it was that that I was drawing upon really. Um, yeah and just the whole idea of the stage of a revolution just sort of fit quite nicely but it was more a personal thing rather than a than a big life event and you have this i mean that's so clearly a current that like runs through uh everything about the story in a really interesting way because you also have these elements of very what seemed from the outside when you're talking about this big rebellion side, like almost this petty teenage stuff at the same time, that's not really petty teenage stuff because it feels, especially when you're a young person or a teenager, the, the, the opposite of petty. It seems like the most important thing in the world, whether it is like jealousy or a crush or like frustration at school or anything like that. Um, where did those elements of the more um, everyday kind of small, things in her life like her crush or like her feeling left out of her friendship group and things like that come from like how did you work those into a much more I guess serious story about what was going on in with her family yeah again I think that was with the help of the editor because she she wanted those lighter moments uh, but like you said then they're light for us now looking back but at the time they're not and again I think I was just um I was drawing upon my own personal experiences and stuff just from school, you know, when you feel really left out and when, and when you do have, have that big crush and you know, there's no way you can act upon it because your parents would kill you. Um, so yeah, so I was drawing, so I was drawing upon sort of like, yeah, just things that I knew and things that I'd been through as well. Um, but knowing that compared to everything else, they did have a lot like a lighter, a lighter feel to them really and it's truthful like you know not everything is like dire and and hard you do need those lighter moments you do if, if not just not just for the reader but you know it's truthful for a character you know there's always something that's lighter in life um again this is like your 15 minute call to the live chat if you have any more questions please do ask yeah. um this is like my every 15 minutes i'm like Hello, live chat. This is your 15 minute call, please, which makes me feel very theatery, uh, which yeah. seems appropriate. Um, uh, just on like a personal level, I love when we get into like the character chat, there's a lot of like, let's go deep into the characters. But I kind of just want to know like, if you have a favorite character or if you have a character that you kind of wish you could spend more time with, one of the side, cause there's a few little side characters. Everyone feels very like 
realized within it and has their own internal lives which we can talk about in a second because there's like a very literal way in which you have conveyed that in this book with those like sections from her mum and her sister's point of view but yeah what was what was like your either your favorite character to write about or the, the kind of character that you really were rooting for or that you found the most interesting or you know anything like that I think my favorite character is actually mum I love mum so do I um, <laughs> I think everyone loves mum like obviously I do I, I love Amber but she was the one and that this is actually something that, that changed a little bit actually in the very first draft Mom was also not sympathetic. She wasn't a sympathetic character. She was consumed with so much anger in terms of um, where she felt like she hadn't got to in life. A little bit like Ruby, that she was really withholding. And I just felt like you know, there needed to be a, a difference. Um, so I, yeah, I made her just more sympathetic. And actually that kind of made her more real and more rounded in a way. And, gave, and also as a story arc, as a character arc, gave us somewhere to go. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, it's mum. And who I'd like to actually spend time with, Tara. I think she's so sweet. <laughs> I really like Tara. Adorable. I'm like, I feel like that about a lot of the characters. I think like, you have these two sections within there that like even before you pick up the book like you can see the slightly different colors in the pages of these two sections one from her mum's point of view and one from her sister's point of view was that something that was always in there like how far into the process of you writing did that decision come to have these kind of poems that weren't Amber's point of view yeah that was quite early actually yeah that was probably mm -mm, maybe second draft I think yeah so really really early on um that I thought it was important to hear their voices and to get that little little point of view and window into their lives. Yeah. And so really, I mean, it's a really interesting points as well in which to put them. Like, how did you decide how early on, I guess, in, in your point of view? Because as a reader, you're reading from Amber's point of view and so you have a very specific idea about like who Amber's mum is, who Amber's sister is from, from her saying yeah. like, this is what they're like and not necessarily having a sympathetic idea of yeah. what, what your family members are like, like you, like you don't. Um, yeah, how did you decide how long to leave it, the reader to make their own sort of assumptions about those characters before you kind of threw in this idea of like, actually there's some stuff going on with them as well that they're thinking about internally. Yeah, exactly, so I wanted that sort of like point where you kind of go, huh, seeing somebody, something, somebody else's point of view, they're not as quite as, as bad as you think. I think it was, I believe uh, I've put them in at a point where that character is having, um, uh, is having a change in their own perspective. Um, so I think with mum, I might have this wrong, um, but I think mum comes in kind of shortly after she's deciding to uh, learn how to learn, oh, am I right to do it? I might do a spoiler. As she's as she's learning things, I'll just say that when she decides to learn stuff. <laughs> so I think it's it comes around that time. So you know she's she's having that little um, that, that, that turning point. Think of words, Manji. Um, and I think again the same with Ruby. I think I wanted her to come in um, at a point where it was getting quite crucial for Ruby um, for the reader. So I don't because I think Ruby has her has her turning point pretty much on, in, in maybe the penultimate section. Um, so it needed to come at a point where I felt like as a reader, we're, we're seeing Ruby being quite hard and then we as the reader need, need, need to know more about her. So Ruby hasn't had that point herself. She has it uh, not, not so long after that, but we as a reader, I felt like now we need to see more of her. And I didn't want to bring it in too early because then I feel like, because I felt like there, you needed to, to feel that, mm, that, that real sort of, you know, break in their relationship and you need to feel that pain. So it needed to come later, I felt. Um, we're gonna go into spoiler chat in a second, but we'll do like a little transition question. So anyone can kind of drift out if they don't wanna be spoiled for things. Um, you mentioned earlier that you're writing book number two. Can you tell us a little bit about, a little bit about that? Is that, are you allowed to say anything or is it like super secret? I think I am, I might yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it'll be out in June um, and uh, again it's a verse novel 
and it is um, a book uh, in, in two voices. So you have two characters, Nat and Sammy, and it's about a friendship between them both. And Sammy is a refugee traveling to the UK from Eritrea. And Natalie lives in Dover and she's training to swim the channel. And it's about um, their, their kind of connection and friendship. That's about as much as I'll say. Good. Um, I'm very excited for that. Um, okay, spoilers, right. This is a bit where I'm like, let's get into it. Um, so what am I going to ask about first? Um, let's talk, oh, we were already talking about mum. Let's talk about mum, why not? Um, so her learning to read and that, cause you are right. Like I literally just had a quick flick through and it, and it is um, the poem half term is the one just before it goes into oh, yeah. And it is like her flicking through the book and like looking yeah. through this kind of, you get the you get the impression that maybe she's this is something that she's now looking to yeah things are changing yeah what for you like what was that um decision for her what made that decision after such a long time that obviously ruby gets like really angry with her about towards the end the idea that it took her so long but like what was that breaking point from her point of view because we obviously only really see amber's point of view of when she sees it occur but you kind of get the sense that she's clearly had her own internal decision making process before that yeah um what has taken her so long um i think it's really she's having her own little rebellions anyway in terms of like keeping money back and stuff and i think she's finally seeing um i feel like for me it was she she does feel guilty and she feels as though she stopped ruby from oh have you gone away oh no Oh no, you're still there? I don't know what just happened to the screen, hello. Oh, you gone away. I'm still here. Oh no, you're back, sorry. I don't know what happened to my screen, you went away. Um, I think she's, she's kind of seeing that Ruby, she didn't allow Ruby, she didn't help Ruby to, to live her, her dreams in terms of like university and getting her married quite young. And um, the inspiration for this actually came from a, a project that I do called Run the World and there was a woman in that group and she just really she inspired the character of mom actually um and she would just she just had it's almost like a breaking point it's no one thing it's that things have been going on for so long and then she was seeing her own daughter her own daughter going the way that her life had gone and she just felt like no it just needs to stop and she really stood up to her husband and it was a very scary situation um but just one day she decided to make that change but they had done it in secret they just done all these little things in secret her and her daughter um and now they're in a safe house and now they're absolutely fine but yeah she was a real inspiration for mom in terms of this very small little rebellions that she's doing herself keeping money back keeping money back um speaking to Bina and stuff um without amber even knowing so it's almost like she she is taking control slowly and then I think the learning how to read was the sort of the last thing really. But yeah, it's sort of not wanting Amber to have the same life that Ruby had. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of kind of, it feels like there's a lot of themes of like um, communication barriers in a lot of ways, both in terms of like literal communication barriers, language barriers, but also the idea of like assuming things for other people. There's a lot of moments in which Amber is like taking a look from someone to mean something that she's like being looked at in a certain way and like very getting very aggressive about it. And the idea of, you know, that you can have, um, I really like there was that the poem that ends with her, with Amber realizing that her mum, when she's like, oh, I'm talking to Bina about like this class at the, at the rec center. And like Amber full on knows that that's not what Bina does, that she, she just like allows women to leave their abusive husbands. And so they both know that they sort of both know, like there's this interesting, but and, and both of them are like literally in the same space dealing with the same thing, yeah. but still can't communicate about it. They still don't feel like they can openly talk about it. And like, even at the end, Amber having left and like knowing that her mom doesn't agree with some of the stuff her dad was saying, still doesn't feel like she can talk to her about a boy. And there's all of these kind of miscommunications. Was that uh, kind of very deliberate? Was that based on stuff that you'd observed from other people and like something that you wanted to dig into within the story? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's something that I observed with others and, and within my own family. We're a, 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 we're 
wonderful in my family of not speaking about anything. <laughs> so, um, and it's taken me as an adult a long time, a long time kind of to learn to sort of like to be open and talk about things and like normal humans. Um, but yeah, I've always found it very difficult like talk about my feelings and talk about what's going on. And yeah, so I kind of wanted that turmoil. I wanted that sort of miscommunication and always sort of like just missing each other. And yeah, which is why I think it's kind of quite special at the end when she finally does sort of like is, is honest with her mum. And that's kind of, yeah, a whole new, a whole, a whole new beginning for their relationship. Um, I kind of vaguely alluded to it, but I, I, I would love to hear you talk about Amber's bullying storyline, because I feel like that's something we don't really see in, in YA and even kids fiction. It's always sort of the other way around. And I found it so like refreshing and interesting to have that portrayal. Like, how did that come about? Was that from, yeah, stuff that you'd observed, things that you like psychologically were interested in exploring what that impetus to be the aggressor, to be the bully comes from? Yeah, um, again, I'm, I'm oversharing, but it's what I do. I'm an actor, I overshare. Uh, <laughs> but at school, I was the bully and I was also bullied. And um, so I really looked within myself and like, yeah, wh why did I? And it was because, I know it sounds a little bit cliche and I'm not taking myself up, you know, I'm not giving myself an excuse or anything, but it was, um, it was just being unbelievably unhappy and feeling unbelievably, um, just not having a voice, not uh, not feeling in, con in control of my life, not feeling like I was worth anything really. So um, yeah, what makes you feel big and cool? Well, yeah, being nasty to someone. Um, so yeah, so I kind of really drew upon my own experience there because um, I, I see a, you know a lot of amber in myself. Um, yeah, and. Yeah, and so and I, and, and so I was bullied. I, I was I was the bully, and then and then I was bullied. So I kind of you know I have both both sides of it, um, but that's where I kind of drew drew upon that, and it felt quite important for me to put that in, um, just because it just in terms of that sort of um, uh, the passing on of trauma and how how it can make one behave really. So just in terms of yeah, dad and then Amber, and then can she change? Can she stop that cycle of, of, of that trauma and then turning that trauma into bullying? Like, yeah, so that, all of that sort of stuff really interests me, still interests me. I think you could definitely, it it's, is interesting because you have these poems within it that do talk about, especially towards the end, about her father and what he's been through, but it's not, it's, that it's, it's a really interesting balance of not wanting to excuse what he's done, but also, thinking like it's important to understand why so that you can break that cycle and change if you just ignore the fact that there is a reason it's happening you can really easily just be like oh it's just one bad person who just appeared out of nowhere and was being horrible and it yeah. was afterwards yeah like I really hope like I know that some people like do read it and I've read sort of reviews where they're like oh the dad's like so nasty and it's like yeah yeah of course he is of course he is um but at the same time but there's some people who really sort of like can read between the lines and they're like oh not that we're excusing anything but there is this um uh, this cycle of trauma basically um and, and and how that can change you as an adult. Um, so I was just really hoping that, yeah, even though dad is is not a sympathetic character, um, that, that, that there's more to it, you know, it's not just evil man, um, there's always more to it. And so, yeah. And I think we do see these moments of him being kind of pathetic in a lot of ways. Like there's this real, like a child having like, and especially that moment where she, that line that I was like, oh, it's such a good line about her because she always gets compared to her dad and she never quite emotes how that makes her feel. Like you're kind of just left as an audience to like interpret the fact that her sister is like her mum and she's like her dad. And you know from what you know of her dad that that's probably not what she wants to hear. And there's that moment where she's like, oh, yeah, everyone talks about how I take off to my dad in terms of like my height and everything. And there's this moment where suddenly I'm like, oh, I'm as tall as my dad. Like this person who's had so much physical power in my house, I I kind of don't need, like, I'm still scared in a way, but it kind of is, it really shifted in that moment to it being less of like, I'm trapped in this place with this like monster and more of a like, oh, this is just kind of pathetic and sad. And like, I just need, we need to leave. Like, and it was such an interesting, like it's such a visual moment, which I think goes with, although a lot of people think of poetry as being quite internal, there's some really beautiful like visual things within this poetry that are just 
have been so um was so interesting to read um I also really like there's a Amber's running I think this is like it kind of it, it's it's so integral to her story but it's also this uh thing that by its nature is separate from what's happening at home um and I just really enjoyed little things like the fact that she she doesn't really win race like when she doesn't win win races it's always because she's paying attention to everyone else and she's like hyper vigilant and she's like she's looking at miss or she's like looking at the girls behind her and she always trips up or she gets like embroiled in like other people's mess and then it's the last poem where she actually wins where she's just thinking about herself and she's like so focused on just like being good for herself that that's when it was like a triumph and I was like these metaphors this <laughs> but it's I mean was obviously you've talked about the idea of like running being really important to you but in terms of that kind of language or understanding of like there being a literal win in her life as well as the kind of metaphorical win of her making her life better like how did you meld those two journeys together of her kind of improving her sport and that stuff and then also her improving her life in general um I don't know I think it just sort of lends I think just the whole sort of like running just sort of lends itself to that sort of metaphor really in terms of um I think I think I sort of took it from uh training for a marathon I remember when I was training for my first marathon and I was training for it uh after after my dad had passed away so it was like really it was something I was using to sort of like uh, help me with grief really um and so I think I remember my journey through 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 training for that and I think I just sort of took that just in terms of like when I started and it was so hard and things wouldn't get thing it just wasn't going right and I remember sort of getting embroiled with sort of like why aren't I going faster um and I would I remember coming back from a 20 mile run and crying because it wasn't fast enough and I remember my partner saying but you, you just ran 20 miles isn't that amazing yeah but it wasn't fast enough and it was just all those inner kind of yeah thinking too much about the outside oh but when I put it on Facebook and then I tell people that I've done a marathon in five hours they're gonna think I'm crap um <laughs> rather than I just ran a marathon guys way me <laughs> do you know what I mean so yeah I think I was sort of taking taking that time in my life actually and sort of yeah just you and using that sort of yeah character development within myself <laughs> and putting that on amber and just in terms of how you can learn and yeah focusing on yourself and not so much on everything else that's going around you and just I think running just lends itself to that metaphor any sport actually lends itself to that metaphor quite well when you're kind of learning it um we talked a little bit to I think it was Jenny actually Jenny Lee when she was on around the experience of like being a marginalized writer and writing about your community and trying to weigh up the decision making process of like how much of a positive vibe do I give to this underrepresented community versus how much do I tell the truth versus how much do I and I kind of was really interested with this book because it feels like you did there was no part of you that was like oh I'm going to sugarcoat everything it was like I'm gonna have this really incredible like powerful girl and mother and sister who are going to like just come out of extraordinary circumstances and be like learning to be more empathetic to each other and to themselves and like incredible stuff over here but then also this element of talking about honor killings talking about um really really strict parenting in a very traditional way how did you as an author decide how to kind of negotiate that was that something that was in your mind were you like I'm just going to talk about what I want to talk about and we'll deal with that afterwards no, it's something that I, it's something that I still think about, and it's something that I'm still really worried about. Like I remember when it was coming out, I started to get a lot of sort of like anxiety, like, oh, are people going to think that I'm basically saying all Asians are like this? Mm. Um, and I just had to sit back, and a lot of people sort of sat with me and sort of friends and said, well, no, this is your story. This is just one story about a family. And you, just because you're brown, it doesn't mean you speak for all brown people. Not all white authors out there are saying, I speak, you know, they're, you're allowed to kind of like write what you want and you're not speaking for your entire um, uh, race of people. Um, so I just kind of have to hold on to that and just kind of go, I'm not speaking for everyone. It's just a story. It is just a story like any other story. Um, but it's a, it's a personal story to me. Um, as well as I feel like, even though, yes, it's about an, an Asian family and stuff, I feel like there's a lot of kind of 
universal um, kind of truths and um, uh, la, 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 words, Manjeet. A lot, a lot of universal themes in there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a lot of universal themes in there that kind of transcend, um, yeah, the, the race or the class of the people that are in the book. I hope. I think so. Um, I've been I, told so, so hopefully. <laughs> As, as someone who has read the book um uh yeah completely agree there's it's it was so interesting to have this character who I felt there were elements especially with poems because I think they're so immediate they're so like in the character's head in a way that like obviously novels and prose are as well but there is just something so like brain to brain about uh <laughs> poems I did that was a weird way of explaining it but it it feels like you really get to the heart of like exactly what's going on in someone's head that you kind of, and you also can see where they're lying to themselves within the poems and and you kind of see where the unreliable narrator stuff is coming. Like there's loads of these elements and there were those parts of it that I was like, I might not be able to relate to the specific like home circumstances that she has, but there are, there are feelings of like loneliness within a friendship group that I think everyone has had at least one time in their lives when they're in a group of people that are their friends, but they still feel a bit like, oh, they prefer if I'm not here? Or like, am I am I like the person who, or like, oh, they, they've they spent loads of time over the summer, like even in school, like, oh God, they I was away for the summer because I had to visit my family and they all spent all their time together and they all have really, really cool, like stuff that they were doing and I'm just over here, like, and they, they're gonna have like gone off without me. And like just all of those kind of things that really felt like there was always some, some resonance, which as someone who literally has, I'm like, what is running? Never heard of her. Um, I was like, come on, I've got to think of, am I going to find nothing? Like I started it being like, is this going to be one of those books where it's a protagonist that I'm really interested in and care about, but I'm like, who are you? Never, never heard of any of this stuff you're interested in, but ended up being very attached to Amber, to be honest. Um, <laughs> we had a, uh, I think we had a recommendation from someone for Kingdom of Souls. I think it was Esme made a recommendation, I think from earlier when we were talking about YA that's really good and Children of Blood and Bone as well, which both excellent. Uh, suggestions can recommend um we're almost at the end of the live stream I'm gonna give one last I kind of missed the quarter hour because we were just so excited about talking um where I say in the chat if you have any more questions now is your last chance please ask them um and uh I'm gonna ask a question that everyone always asks me to ask um authors which is would you like there to be an adaptation of your book and if so like do you have thoughts about like who you would want to play the characters did you envision like when you were making the characters do you are you the kind of author who knows exactly what they look like or like we were talking to Jennifer last week and she was like I genuinely don't really know what my main character looks like because she was so focused on like seeing through her eyes she was like I vaguely know what she looks like but there's I don't actually I don't like have a person in mind when I visualize her um so yeah I'm kind of interested whether that's something that you thought about or had a kind of even if it's like a little secret like oh be kind of fun if that person played my own um, <laughs> um I do have a vague idea of what they would look like um that I mean uh nothing's in the works for a sort of like tv or film adaptation even though a hell yes please um but definitely working on a stage a stage adaptation um so we might be casting people soon actually um but it's really, really early stages. But yeah, I have a vague, a vague idea. But there wouldn't be any any actors that you know. <laughs> they're just, they're just like basically people that I know that I've kind of like worked with and that I've seen on the circuit. But then nobody famous that I can think of. Um, but yeah, I do, I do have a kind of vague idea of what what, what the casting type would be. Uh, this is hilarious. So I just saw as you were speaking in the chat. Um, that Pippin was like, oh, um, Emily on the Discord had a question and I went to the Discord and the question was, thank you for this wonderful book. It gave me such confidence. Would you ever want to transfer your book to the stage? So incredible synchronicity there. Um, <laughs> I think that would work. it would be so interesting. It would work so well, but it would be a really interesting transformation to figure out what those other voices look like and how that will play out. Oh, oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, now I'm really into that idea. I'm gonna, I mean, also just the idea of uh, theatre in general, being in a room with other human beings. What a concept, oh, oh, Lord, 2020. Um, that, I mean, that's also a question that we've uh, we've talked a couple of times about on this, um, these live streams, because um, obviously you're like writing something new now. Are you, are you taking what's currently happening into account for that? Is that something that's, 
that you're kind of just in a perpetual writing a perpetual 2019 sort of novel where we we just don't talk about what's happening because I I kind of feel like that's the vibe that most people have got right now is like yes <laughs> never heard of her yeah basically yeah um so I mean I wrote the first couple of drafts uh, yeah before obviously the pandemic hit so it was all very um very up to date it would have been like yeah, up to like 2020. And then I was like, nah, I'm taking it back. <laughs> now the novel goes from 2018 to 2019. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah, Pippin's just gone like, yes, I miss theater in the chat. What a mood, what an absolute mood. Um, uh, oh, Esme has asked, if, if you were to transfer it to the stage, would it work as a musical or would it be a straight play? Oh, um, it's mm, at the minute it's a straight play, but um, yeah, there's going to be a, quite a lot of like movement in it. It's going to be very movement heavy, um, yeah, and and keeping to that spoken word sort of elements and a lot of kind of like doubling up of characters and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's going to be quite different. It's not going to be like a national theatre production of a revolving stage and big set. It's going to be a bit more sort of um, sparse and modern and different. Mm. I'm very into that. Um, we, we've unfortunately come to the end of our, of our mm. time together. Um, I will just remind people who are currently watching because there, there are, uh, uh, Esme for example in the chat I think has joined are just, you know, off the cuff on a whim uh, and is asking about how the book club works. Um, we are reading a book every single month and um, the I'm actually going to be doing a video on this very channel about all of the books coming up. We're just finalizing like the first six months of next year so we can tell everyone like all of the authors at once and get really excited about it. Um, so yeah, subscribe to this channel and you'll be able to get that alert in your sub box. Um, but we have a discord where we all chat about bookish stuff. We're using the hashtag, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very exciting. Um, but next week, uh, next month in December, because the last Tuesday of the month, I think is like New Year's Eve, we are not doing one. December is a, we're skipping December. Um, the platform channel will be running uh, with a really exciting, I, I don't know if I can say who it is, but we've got an amazing booktuber who's going to be co-running a little readathon with us. So we're doing something a bit different instead of the book club. Um, but when we are doing um, uh, January, I can let you know that it is going to be Jennifer Niven and we are going to be reading Breathless, which is very exciting because it is going to be January and freezing cold and Breathless is a very summery novel. So we're going to be transporting ourselves in the uh, Discord. We might talk about a recipe for a pina colada, a little virgin pina colada or something like that, just to um, give us those vibes. Um, all that remains to be said, thank you so much everyone for joining us, uh, either live or if you're watching this afterwards. Uh, and a massive thank you to Manjeet for joining us. It has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you and to um, essentially find out about everything, everything from, the, from the behind the scenes of this incredible, incredible book. Thank you so much for having me, it's been brilliant. And then I, we will see all of you guys in January. Bye. And we are done.